Cool, cool. So this is presentation, ADHD management, uh, medication in the brain. So first we want to, you know, clarify what ADHD is. Um, ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and it is one of the most common mental disorders affecting children. Um, symptoms can include inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Um, it affects the lives of those who have it in an academic and professional setting and interpersonal as well. Um, and the three main types that somebody can be diagnosed with is predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, or a combined presentation of the both of them. Um, here are the symptoms that somebody would need to exhibit to be diagnosed with predominantly inattentive type. Um, so six are needed to be present if they are younger than 17. And if they are 17 or older, then only five need to be present. Um, some of these include not being able to pay close attention or making careless mistakes on things, um, problems, problems staying focused on tasks, um, not following through on instruction, like if somebody's asking them to do their homework or do chores and a couple hours have passed and they still have not even attempted to do it, um, problem, problem organizing things like their, their rooms or their workspace. Um, they dislike doing things that take um, sustained mental effort, or I think we call them non-preferred tasks. Um, often losing things like keys and wallets. Um, very easily distracted. For hyperactive, Type. This is more of the classic presentation of what we think of when we think of ADHD. So squirming in your seat, not being able to stay seated, running around, um, not being able to like sit and read a book or um, like even color in a coloring book, like not being able to sit still and do that. Feeling like they're being driven by a motor, like they have to move. Um, blurting out answers to questions, even when some, someone's not finished talking, interrupting others, having a difficult time waiting their turn. And then combined presentation is just when we have both aspects of an attentive and hyperactive together um, for someone with ADHD. Um, we're still not sure what the direct link that causes ADHD is, but we have some running theories on what could be going on. Um, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that genetics play a big role in ADHD. Usually if somebody has a first degree relative like mom or dad or a sibling that has ADHD, then it's a high possibility that um, your client will have ADHD as well. Um, there are several, several genes that are linked to that, but no specific gene or gene combination that has been specifically identified with it. Um, also looking into um, anatomical differences in the brain of people with uh, ADHD they think there might be um, reduced gray and white matter volume in the brain um, and that different regions of the brain are activated in those with ADHD um, when asked to do certain tasks than people who don't have ADHD. Um, also, non-genetic factors can play a role. Um, low birth weight, premature birth, um, mom while pregnant, drinking alcohol, smoking, or being exposed to lead, and just extreme stress during pregnancy as well. Now we're going to get into some treatments for ADHD. So for children who are six, uh, younger than six, 
it is not recommended to use medications. It is actually the preferred method to do parent training in behavior management um, before even thinking about medications. Um, it has been found that it can be, it can work just as well as medications for these clients. Um, these clients who are younger than six do have a harder time tolerating the, the stimulants and medications than children six and up. So it's just a safer route while their bodies are still growing. Um, and also they just experience less side effects like the appetite suppression, um, insomnia, and sometimes causing ag uh, aggressive behaviors. Um, children who are six years old and older, um, they, the recommendation is to do a combination of medication and behavior therapy together. Um, this is also when we can see behavioral classroom interventions and school supports that can be super helpful for those with ADHD. Um, ADHD medications work depending on the type of medication that we're talking about, stimulants versus non-stimulants versus antidepressants. However, all ADHD medications do work in some capacity by increasing um, the neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. Incre they just kind of do it at different levels. Increasing the levels of these neurotransmitters help with attention span, reducing hyperactivity, con controlling impulsivity, and managing executive functioning, which is obviously all the things that we want to see in ADHD management. Um, what works for one person might not work for another. And um, the first ADHD medication that somebody tries, it might not be the right one for them. Um, so just making sure to tell clients like, hey, like there's so many options out there. We're gonna try the most common options um, and see if they work, but it might not, but we do have other options. Um, the main reasons for discontinuation um, for uh, medications right off the bat is that they're not effective, they have really bothersome side effects, and, or they're not at a high enough dose for um, it to be effective for them. Um, so we're gonna go over the different types of ADHD medications. First, we're gonna talk about stimulants, um, which is the most common type of prescribed medication for ADHD. Um, they come in two different types. The first type is immediate release or short acting medication. And these can usually last up to four hours and they're, you're more likely to experience a crash with this type of medication. Um, the most common medications that we prescribe here that are immediate release are the Focalin, Ritalin, and Adderall immediate release versions. Um, for extended release is our second option. It's the long acting medication. Luna, stop. Um, it's typically taken once in the morning um, and they usually last six to eight hours but some of them say they last for up to 16 hours, but it's usually not that long. Um, can't they, these can result in fewer ups and downs with a more gradual onset and come down from the medication. Um, they do, however, last all day. So there's more appetite suppression with these medications. Um, some of the common medications that we see prescribed in the extended release is Astaris, Concerta, Contempla, Focalin, Jornet, which is actually a medication that you take at night. And then it re starts releasing the medication in the morning. It can help for kids who have a really hard time waking up and getting started in the morning. Um, Ritalin, sustained release, 
Ritalin long acting, Adderall extended release, and then Vyvanse. Um, many people do supplement an extended release medication with an immediate release medication in the mid to late afternoon to help push through um, like after work when they want to get maybe some chores done like dishes or things and laundry or um, school activities or homework. Uh, Non-stimulants is um, our next topic. Um, these are not controlled substances like stimulants are. Um, they do take longer to start working than stimulants, and you may not see the full effect of them take place until about three to four weeks of taking them consistently. Um, they might be prescribed if stimulants are not effective or you experience really intolerable side effects with stimulants. Um, it can also be paired with a stimulant to increase effectiveness. Um, primarily, these are norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or alpha-2 adrenergic agonists. And these are usually Stratera, Quelbri, Clonidin, and uh, Guanfazine. Um, usually, um, clonidin is used for sleep, help with sleep, and guanfazine is usually um, mostly used for like impulse control issues. Um, and then some antidepressants um, as well can also help with ADHD management. Um, these are usually prescribed in combination with um, stimulants as they are not super effective on their own. Um, and these are, again, usually norepinephrine, dopamine, reuptake inhibitors, and tricyclics. Most common that you'll see is Welbutrin and nortriptyline. Um, some positives that medications can bring, um, better academic achievement, improvements in family and social relationships, smoother functioning in the morning, um, avoidance of later substance abuse, as those with untreated ADHD usually do try to self-medicate with some kind of substance, especially later on in their life, um, and improvements in overall quality of life. Um, there are, of course, some drawbacks to ADHD medications, as with any medication. Um, there can be, especially for children, an attachment of stigma by peers and educators. Um, if they're on an ADHD medication, there might be, you know, ass assumptions that, oh, this kid's going to be a problem student, difficult to handle, things like that, before they even get to know the kid. Um, there also could be possible interruption of a child's routine to administer medication. Sometimes, the medication takes a little bit longer to kick in. I've heard people say, oh, it takes an hour and a half for my child's medication to kick in. And so we have to give it, we have to wake them up at 5, 6 a.m. to take the pill so that it's kicked in by the time they go to school. Um, or they have to leave in the middle of the day to take their immediate release. Um, to go to the nurse to get their second dosage of medication. Um, there are also possible side effects, some of which is insomnia and appetite suppression. Um, there are others, of course, and we'll get into that a little bit later. There is also the stimulant shortage that we've been dealing with and the complications of dealing with a controlled substance in general. It can It's very complicated to get um, a controlled substance nowadays, it as it should be, is as it should be, um, but you can only send in 30 days at a time. Um, they can't pick them up early. If they lose them, they cannot get more in, in that month um, unless we increase the dose, which isn't recommended to do just so that somebody can get more. Um, 
and having to possibly try different medications and dosages. It can be really difficult for a family to have to trial so many different medications. Um, and sadly, there's just no way to predict how a child will react to any given medication, whether it will help significantly or if it'll cause side effects that are really disruptive, like insomnia or aggressive behaviors. So some side effects of the stimulants. Um, the most common side effects that we see are stomach ache, headache, decreased appetite, sleep problems, um, behavioral rebound, rebound, especially after the medication has worn off. Um, but most of these side effects, like the stomach ache, headache, um, do subside after one to two weeks of taking the medication. Sometimes the appetite suppression does subside as well. Some rare side effects that, um, that people might experience with stimulants is dizziness, syncope, irritability. Um, if they have ticks, there might be a tick exacerbation. Um, if they really cannot tolerate it, then there might be hallucinations, psychosis, mania. And if that's the case, then we know that this stimulants are just not for them and we should go the non-stimulant route at that point. Um, anxiety, depression, aggression. Um, when prescribing medications, we're looking for the best effect with the most minimal side effects. Um, what to do when somebody has worsening side effects? Um, if they become intolerable and the client is not having enough positive effect to justify continuing the medication, um, then we would obviously consider stopping the medication. Um, we have different options, like I've said before, trying different stimulants. There's the amphetamine, which is more of the Adderall and Vyvanse, versus the methylphenidates, which is the Focalin, Ritalin um, category. Um, immediate release versus extended release, trying these different combinations and options might find a better fit for the clients. Um, if anxiety or depression has increased due when the stimulant was started, then we might consider addressing those underlying situations um, with medication management like SSRIs before continuing with stimulants. Um, if multiple stimulants have been trialed and have not been tolerated, again, we would consider starting them on a non-stimulant medication. Um, the thing with non-stimulant medication is that it just might not be as effective in treating the ADHD symptoms and will take longer to show improvement than the stimulants which can be disheartening to hear. Um, of course, with stimulants, there is the risk of dependency and abuse. Um, that is why they are a controlled substance. Um, so when we first meet the client, we obviously, especially with our adult clients and adolescent clients, we do an assessment of substance abuse history, um, asking about all substances, no matter what they are, and when the last time they used, how often do they use, and at what intensity are they using. If it's just smoking marijuana on the weekends, socially with friends, that's okay. But if they're doing it every day, maybe experimenting with cocaine or MDMA, that's when we might consider talking about different options um, than stimulants. We also at LOA have clients sign the controlled substance agreement paperwork at the in-person appointment. Um, this details how um, the controlled substances will be prescribed and that the provider um, reserves the right to drug test if they are suspicious of drug use with the stimulants. 
Um, we also, before prescribing the stimulant, check the Illinois Prescription Monitoring Program, um, which takes control of and like monitors all controlled substances, not just stimulants, to make sure that the client isn't quote unquote shopping around for prescribers and getting multiple prescriptions um, from different providers. Uh, last, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was uh, medication holidays. Um, you might have heard clients say like, oh, I stopped taking my stimulant like when I went to on vacation, it was nice to not take it or kids might not take it on the weekends. Um, with stimulants, taking a holiday from the medication actually can be very helpful to um, negate tolerance buildup and having to possibly go up on higher doses of stimulants. There are some cases, especially with younger children who do have issues with behaviors associated with their ADHD symptoms, um, that it is more suggested to take the medication as if they stop taking it and then take it, there's so much whiplash with the behaviors and things like that, that it just is easier to have a more consistent, stable routine and regimen with these clients. It's a lot less damaging to them to continue the medication. Um, most adults can handle not taking the medication when not working, um, but of course it's up to their discretion. I'm never gonna say like, oh, you have to take holidays. I always bring it up as an option if they want to do it, but they don't have to. And then those are my resources. Thank you so much. So helpful. Um, I was gonna say too, if anybody has other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And I know Dr. Kisson had a couple of questions. In there. So she said interesting around, or sorry, journey and taking it at night. Um, never heard of uh kind of two pieces one is insurance covering it and then two does it impact sleep good question so it is a brand um medication right now it does not have a genetic or generic formulation at this point in time but i have mm -hmm. found that if somebody has pretty good insurance they can actually get it covered pretty pretty easily and on their website they also and Sorry, how long has it been out? It probably is just me not in the medication. Oh, it hasn't been out long. Not oh, it hasn't long. Been out that long. Okay. Not super long, no. Um, but it's like um if somebody uh I'm sorry, lost my train of thoughts. I'm sorry, I was just removing do you mind removing your the presentation so we can Oh have yeah, a, yeah, totally. I was about to kick off your presentation, but yeah, thank you. Cool. Um Oh, as I, um, I think I was saying, or no. oh, they offer coupons. They offer coupons on their website as well um, because they want people to try it. They want to get it out there. So they do offer like ways to get it cheaper. Um, it, does, it doesn't impact sleep. So you take it the night before and it doesn't start releasing the medication until the, that morning. Interesting. So it, it kind is. Of like it's time. very. It's very different from all the other ADHD medications. Yeah, and I guess that's what makes it unique is the, its delivery methodology. That it. Yes, it's time. not immediate. Oh, huh, cool. Yeah. Okay, that's just uh, good. Good to be educated. If somebody says, I'd be like, is that really a thing? So now I won't make that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's okay. super interesting. It's it's actually yeah. like I, I saw it. And I was like, oh, it's really it's really nice for like kids who like don't want to get out of bed in the morning and right. like stuff like that. Or a lot of adult clients who sort of the things that they would need to the executive function to take the medication, like, OK, I need to actually get myself up and then make my coffee and then remember to go take my medic. It's sort of like needing the medication first in order to remember to be organized to take the medication. So definitely that sounds helpful. 
Yeah, no, it's it's definitely it's definitely an interesting one. They do usually insurance does suggest that you like fail um some of the more cheaper options first. But mm -hmm. I have some clients who have just kind of like worked with their insurance companies being like, Hey, like we want to try this. I know it's not a generic, like what 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 are you willing to cover? kind of thing. And then they have right. the coupons on the website as well. Yeah. And also good RX. I don't know if anyone's had any clients who their prescriptions are either like they didn't meet their deductible or are still really high, but sometimes with a good RX subscription app, like it could even be better than with one's insurance company too. I just recently Definitely. discovered that. Yeah, yeah, I'm constantly suggesting GoodRx to people. It could be a game changer. Like I just tried it myself and it was, yeah, so. Save money where you can. Uh-huh. Okay. And then I think my next question, actually, I just, Susanna, what was my next question? Because I, I can't yeah, see it. It was, it was related to um, d genetic testing. Which, so does genetic testing have any information to guide ADHD medication effectiveness? That's I'm kind question. of assuming no, but... the You mean like the gene sight testing? Insight testing, yeah. Yeah, if it does a little bit. It's not as like in-depth as it is with like the antidepressants and all that stuff. Um, it There are some where there's like no... They don't know what the genetic like code is yet that is like metabolizing the medication yet. Mm -hmm. So they can't give us any information on it. But I think, I think Focalin, I think it's more so the methylphenidates. They, they can. Okay. Um, okay. And so are the age limits for the gene site test? Could, could it be like, yeah, from children to yeah, it's anyone. You, anyone, anyone can do the gene site yep. testing. Um, and just for everybody, I know, I think Lisa might have done a shout out in the last newsletter that uh, clients have always been able to do gene site testing, but we've just sort of formalized making it a little bit easier to integrate it into, or maybe we talked about it at the staff meeting um, as a tool in the toolbox when selecting yeah. medication. If they're only doing it for ADHD medications, I wouldn't right, say I wouldn't do it that. for that, right. But if they, right. they're doing it for a bunch of different ones, for sure. Okay, okay. And then I have one more question, and then I'm gonna let if someone else has a question. In terms of side effects, you might have said this, and I might have missed it, but for children, uh, any impacts on growth I feel like that was a little bit of a controversy and I don't know what the data actually shows for children on stimulate, like how much it does impact growth. There definitely can be an impact on growth. Um, I think that's one of the main reasons why they don't suggest starting it for kids who are under six. Um, but we do keep track of it. Okay. Um, that's why we usually... Like every month or two, we get a weight um, and height. And then obviously, they're also supposed to be going to their pediatricians um, for yearly um, check-ins where they could also put them on a growth chart and see like if they're not, if they're lower than um, average or what have you. And if that does happen, then we can always discuss coming off the stimulants. All right. So that's probably very helpful for parents. And I think for, as therapists, psychologists, we we are not, I was I'm not a prescriber, but when we could be helpful in the psychoeducation and if we're with parents who I, you know, have tried everything and it just our family, we're falling apart with stressors, but I'm really worried about where we tend to be tiny people and I don't want to impact growth. And just to say like, I'm not, and I always really try to go very light with edu that you could have a appointment with one of our nurse practitioners just for that education and learning. That doesn't mean you're doing anything that you need to do anything. You're just a consumer who's looking to learn more 
what I do know is that that's something that is monitored actively and with your physician. And if it ever would be a concern, then there'd be a pivot as well. So I like to know just enough to bridge the conversation to the prescriber and kind of take down some of the stress and anxiety around medication enough that informed conversations can happen. And that's kind of where I see our role on the therapy side when it comes to medication is there's so much fear and misinformation and self judgment. There's so many psychological factors that get in the way of just getting information that we wouldn't do with other aspects of life. We wouldn't spend like years. Should I get my kid glasses? Maybe I should have eaten more carrots when I was pregnant. Like we, but uh, I think there's a lot more fear and shame when it comes to uh, psychotropic medication. And so if we as therapists can help those conversations, it's it's a it's a very important service to our clients. Yeah, I think it's definitely hard with ADHD too because it is one that sticks with you. There is no cure for it, and you, you, you obviously you can learn coping mechanisms, behavioral strategies, things of that nature. Um, but it's never gonna completely go away. Yeah. Um, uh, even with medications, medications can only do so much to bring down the symptomology of ADHD. Um, so learning how to cope with it in different ways, which is what all of you guys do, which is wonderful, um, is definitely needed in part with the medications as well. Yeah. So sort of that depression co-occurring I'm hoping the children of today versus when we see a lot of adults who had untreated ADHD, you'll hear a lot of like, oh, I wasn't good in school or I'm just lazy mm -hmm. or I'm, I just wasn't motivated enough or I, I don't like learning. And it's unfortunate that 20 years ago, there, there weren't as many different approaches to learning and, and diagnosing to allow for different paths forward. But I'm hoping we're kind of getting at that because there, there are a lot of adults that it just turns into a, a lot of negative feelings towards self yeah. that then we're treating that a lot in session too. True. Okay. Yeah. Other questions in the or Yeah. Sarah S., you had a question about um how long would you recommend someone tries a medication before switching to another and sorry if you want to speak to it too it sounded like you were it, the larger picture was about like efficacy um yeah i just i've had a few clients who were recently um like put on medication um and they were like yeah like i noticed like maybe something first few days and now, you know, it's been a few weeks and they're not really getting anything. And um, they see outside providers for the prescribing. And I'm just curious, like how long you recommend for before somebody like switches? Oh, good question. Yeah, I guess it depends on what the dosage is. If we're at a really low dose, then obviously there's room to go up and they might find more efficacy at a higher dose. If they're reaching the higher, dose level, you know, uh, it might be more advantageous to switch to a different medication. Um, so like, say, say they're at like Adderall extended release five milligrams. Well, we can go up to 40 milligrams, you know, so if, if they can, if there's definitely room to go up, then I would, and they're not experiencing like intolerable side effects um usually that means that they're going to tolerate it well so we can go up um pretty i won't say quickly because i hate to go up quickly and cause those intolerable so side effects um but usually i tr what i try to do is every two weeks like check in and be like how has this been working for you good is it making you hate your life at all no cool let's go up then <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's really helpful to know and just kind of have yeah, that benchmark because 
as um, Dr. Kusun was saying, like us as a therapist kind of dealing with some of that maybe like hopelessness or, well, I tried something and it didn't work. So like, it's never going to get better. Um, right. And if it's their first time trying, I mean, just remind them like there's so many options, so many, so many options. It's just sometimes it takes finding that, that right one. Uh, I also had a question about the relationship between the um, serotonin and dopamine, like on one of your slides, you were talking about, um, you know, most of the medications are stimulants working more on the dopamine side of things. Um, but could you speak at all, like, of how the SSRIs, which, you know, usually are targeting serotonin uptake, how that kind of relates? So serotonin does not really play a role in um, any kind of like motivation, um, focus, things like that. That doesn't mean if somebody is like having really bad anxiety and so that's lowering their motivation or they're having really bad depression and that's what's lowering their motivation and focus, that increasing those medications and taking away those symptoms of depression and anxiety won't sub in relation increase their motivation and um focus but in those cases i would say that they're not more so adhd related then it's more so because they were experiencing depression and anxiety um yeah yeah mentioned a really good insurance so i just wanted you to elaborate on that when I say pretty good insurance, I mean, it de really depends on the job that people have. Um, if they're paying for, you know, really high deductible, like, coverage, you know, if they're paying for the best plan that their company offers instead of maybe the cheapest plan, I'm, usually they're more willing to cover um things that they wouldn't cover for people who aren't paying more money um so, hey, is there any i'm just wondering within that question is there anything more specific just um, what does it mean I, and i if it was just that general one when it comes to for our clients like we don't know <laughs> if if we as clinicians like we can't and we we can't be responsible and as an organization for like the benefit level for each client and so sometimes that can make the work that we do it, it does make it complicated like if they want us to speak with maybe like a teacher at the school or everyone's plans and benefit structure in the healthcare industry is fragmented and is a mess and so i try to really talk very gent like kind of i do a lot of hands off with when a client is asking about this is like really your best bet is to contact your insurance company because they they care a lot less <laughs> what the provider is going to say but the the patient is a customer so they should always even if it's annoying and i would even maybe in session with someone if they're pushing like i want to do a neuropsych but i don't know is my insurance going to cover it that would be a good behavioral activation exercise with that client. Let's call in session because for the last four weeks, you keep saying you want to do it, but you don't know if it's covered. Actually contacting the, each individual's benefit structure is going to depend on their either employer, 80% of the country gets through an employer, or if they buy it on the market. It is so specific to each individual that the best thing that we can do is is empowering clients and teaching them and actually the distress tolerance of having an annoying phone call and learning does that kind of make sense when it comes to insurance yeah plans? yeah totally understand that i was just curious of why like what lauren meant when she said pretty good insurance and that statement from earlier so i just wanted to know where her brain was at when she said that right, right, and when right. elaborated on that lauren totally yeah 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 mm -hmm. like the richer pharmacy benefits some have no co-pays and some fully responsible. Lauren, I won't over that, but I don't know if there's no. Any and usually when like somebody is asking for a medication that I know doesn't have a generic, I say like, no matter who they are, I say, just so you know, like your insurance might not cover this at all. 
and it's going to be pricey. Um, they do have the coupons on the website. I don't, I can't assume what their, you know, financial situation is, but I just let them know, like, there are medications out there that do have generic options that might be a little bit more financially feasible. Um, but I say, call your insurance, see what they say. And I've been surprised. I've been surprised mm -hmm. before. And they've been like, yeah, they said they cover it. No problem. And I'm like, fantastic. That's awesome. Great. That's great for you. You're, you, you have good insurance is usually what I say. Lauren, I love that just proceeding forward always with the, if the insurance company delights us, but just, yeah, versus somebody getting really set on something and getting their hopes up and then getting there and realizing that it's price prohibitive. So, you know, it's unfortunate to have to get clients on alert about it, but it is something it's better to proceed with information than assuming it's going to be okay. So Lauren, I love that you say that. Because usually it comes back to me and they're saying, you didn't tell right. me this one was going to be $2,000. And I'm like, right. <laughs> right. like, that's not me. That's not on me. <laughs> um, David, I know David had a chance and then we have Anna. Yeah, really quickly. Um, I know I've I've worked with some families that prefer that their kids, you know, try some therapy first without medication. They don't want them to become dependent. So I'm wondering if there's any other insight. Usually I just tell them that, you know, especially when it comes to ADHD, medication is going to help make the therapeutic process a little bit more effective, essentially. Um, but even beyond ADHD, is there any other insight that you think would be helpful to share with families that maybe are hesitant to consider medication as an option? Totally. Um, for ADHD, usually what I would say is just so you know, especially for kids six and older, the first line treatment is medications. Doesn't mean we can't try therapy and see what happens and see how it goes. Um, but it's good to and tell them there are options. We don't have to, if somebody, someone comes into me and they're like, I don't want to start with stimulants. I want to go the non-stimulant route and see how that goes. I'm willing to try that. You know, I know stimulants can be scary and they have, they come with a lot of baggage and side effects and things like that. So if someone says, I want to try the non-stimulants first, I'm willing to try that. Um, as long as they understand that it might not be as effective as a stimulant um, and are willing to put in that work of taking the medication for three to four weeks and knowing that we're not going to see results until then. Um, David, yeah. I'm gonna, sorry, I'll jump into that too. Cause I think it applies to all, like you said, not just ADHD and we're all going to see a lot of clients who are at the, uh, I'd say if you think about it in terms of motivational interviewing, like in ambivalence where, okay, I tried that. It's not working. I tried this. So they're kind of coming to us on the therapy side and they're still, Frust, they're frustrated. It's not working, but mm, I don't want medication. That feels too hard or scary, and that that's okay. That's their journey, and so I, uh, you know, I'm never going to argue for change because then someone's going to argue for why that doesn't make sense, and that all of it is okay. But what I would point out is. <laughs> in terms of what you're reporting back, like the family level distress that in the past week, zero to 10, you said that you guys are at like a nine, trying to leave the house in the morning. And you personally, as a parent are talking about the anxiety and just sort of the lack of joy you've been feeling within your family unit too. So just understand that all of these things interact and, and they deserve to be addressed. And so when deciding about medication and managing ADHD, you know, the frustration that you're feeling when you're interacting with your child, that that's something they feel too. And so all of, and so I guess it's just about kind of expanding, panning out a little bit too, because in that moment they're like, I don't want to put a foreign substance at first. And they're kind of forgetting all the last factors that they've been reporting the rest of the the session and it, it's a it's a decision that is complicated and that's okay but you know you all deserve 
peace and joy and uh, also another factor, like when it comes to ADHD could be the correlation of untreated ADHD with depression, with uh, career trajectory, with, they're just different factors. What else did you say, Lauren? Potential with? future substance abuse. Future substance abuse, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's a journey in deciding which aspect, and the good news is nobody's gonna rush you, nobody's gonna inject a medicate. You could take your time and get informed and pace the how you want to consider each tool in the toolbox and i think that kind of settles down uh hopefully that like you could consider and you could learn and that doesn't mean you're making a rapid decision in medicating your child and they can always make an appointment with me or any other the prescribers just to get information they don't have to like come in and we're going to be like what medication do you want? Cause I'm, I've already pulled it up and I'm calling the pharmacy right now to bring, put it in. Like if they just want to come in and have questions and have some of their concerns addressed, that's totally fine. And especially for parents, I, we don't prescribe medications until we see the kids in person anyways. So that first session with parent intake can be like, mostly informational for them like this is what we do this is how this is our take on prescribing things here um we usually go the go low go slow method here um and, well, we, and i love um, that we should write that down somewhere go low go slow i really i don't know if you've said that before i really like it though go oh, yeah. that's nice thank you go low and just letting them know there's so many options for them, um, whether it be stimulant or non-stimulant. The internet's a scary place and the stimulant's gonna tell you worst case horror stories first before they tell you any good things. So coming to one of us and in, in getting information is always uh, better. The, for sure. the, inter the internet will say like, if you take stimulants, you will become dependent and die. So, because that's what they, you know, the horror stories are everywhere. Right. Awesome. Thank you both. Of course. And then, Anna? Yeah. Uh, this has been coming up a lot, I think, of where ADHD, even ODD, a lot of it where my kid's not going to put meds in his mouth. He barely takes vitamins. He'll fight me out at a hundred percent. I don't know, like from conversations you've had with parents, Lauren, is there any like advice you have for that or any tips and tricks that you've given parents for like, Hey, like the meds are going to help a ton, but we start have to like at least start implementing it. And so like how to help families with that when the kids are so extremely resistant to anything new in their routine or Literally even just swallowing a pill, <laughs> like totally. that can be not very big for some children. Totally. Good news is ADHD is like kid. It's like kid centric, you know, so, or at least it was for a long time. So a lot of the medications either come in a liquid form or a chewable form, like Vyvanse comes in a chewable. Um, so there's options. I'm not going to say the flavors are the best options. There's like a banana flavor, I think, and like a peppermint flavor, which some kids are like not cool with. But, you know, it's better than swallowing a pill. <laughs> um, and I know I the ADHD. Totally unaware of that. Thank yeah, you. no. There's so many of my clients, which I, I like, and, we didn't know that. And Anna, I would ask these parents too, because. Yeah, yeah, yeah there is the a patch too, Sarah. You're right. Oh, uh, oh wow. That's fair. Like if a kid, for example, needs an antibiotic, part of the ODD is like establishing like you you pick your battles. And if this is the yeah. one thing that you're going to start with, like because whether it's getting them to the dentist or what happens when they need to take for strep an antibiotic. And so if this is the one thing like we love you and this is happening, like I'm I, I would be not bit against like holding the note like this is going in. And like we mean because this is about your health and how are they getting it doing other medication that's required if it's that so like if this is the one thing there's a sheriff in town 
So Lauren, I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, it depends on, I wouldn't do this with a 17 year old, but. Totally, uh, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, it is like a balance of like wanting compliance and like, and I feel like once the kids start you know, taking yeah. the med and realizing like, oh, this is making my life a little bit easier, especially with the stimulants, because they work so quickly, they're more willing to take it. They still might like put up a little bit of a fight, but they're, they're more willing to. There are also some of them where you can like open the capsule and put it on some pudding or applesauce. Um, usually not the extended release though. Usually the extended release has to stay in the capsule, but the Vyvanse is extended release and they have a chewable form. So it's me and Mary Grace have this like big like sheet of paper, like a laminated paper that we have with all the medications on it. It has like a grid that tells us like which medications can be opened up and which ones can be or are liquid and all that stuff and what flavors they come into. So it's really, it's really helpful. I reach for it all the time. Great. Thank you, Lauren. I really appreciate it. This, we literally set up an appointment for this mom that I'm thinking of where her son literally like third grade refuses to learn to read, refuses to wash his hands or wipe his butt. So like, we're pretty sure that like all of that is going to help a ton. So like everything's a fight. So this is going to be huge. Thank you so much. Totally. I also, I have an issue swallowing pills. So I say like take a carbonated beverage, sparkling water, pop. It usually makes the pill float um, at least a little bit more than like water. And so it like, you don't, the tongue doesn't touch it you know, which is usually I feel like the big issue or like trying straws because straws will like propel the medication back instead of like sipping. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm terrible at taking pills. So I know, I know all the tricks. And we could do pill, you know, exposures, even like if, if you have a compliant kid who just has a fear of swallowing, like we could do that kind of work. But if it's just a utterly non-compliant little kid then kind of working on the parent management training side or the space side and this is like the number one thing uh that we're just gonna go for because you know when someone's in second grade that parents are legally responsible for the healthcare decision so we can't wait for them to be compliant to get the medication that they need really good question and we're gonna see a lot of those kind of cases Lauren, thank you good. so, yeah. Lauren, thank you, yes. Of course.